All right, I think we'll get started. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our listeners and our participants today. I'm Lisa Clark. I'm the Executive Director of the Destination Medical Center's Economic Development Agency. And I'm very happy to have you joining us. So thank you for taking time out of your day today to be with us. Today's session is one of three in a series of uh, DMC updates, uh, which we, we are sort of celebrating in a sense our five year adventure into DMC and our plan. And we're gonna give you some updates on that. Earlier this week, we invited uh, Urban Three, a firm to talk about building strong cities and what that means to communities, local, state, and regional. Um, and today we're gonna to take a bit of a deeper dive into the DMC, what we've done in the past and what, what the future looks like. And then next week, we're gonna talk about the COVID impact and how that impacts our community as well. So I'll start by just talking about, um, I'll take a time on just a couple of slides to talk about um, what this particular five-year update really is. We can go to the next slide. So a five-year update is really our opportunity and we need to meet requirements of the state law about the five-year update. And um, it's a great opportunity for us to take a look at DMC, where we've been, what the market conditions um, are for us today and what they look like in the next five years. So we'll take a look back at the five years that uh, have happened before us and then we'll take a look forward. And we wanna make sure that we gather community input during this time because this really makes a difference to our community, what the benefits are and what you think we could be doing better in terms of our five year update. Next slide. The top line outputs that you'll see in our five-year update for our 20, it's a 20-year plan, just to remind everybody, DMC is a 20-year plan. Um, we're gonna report on the first phase. So we feel very strong that we are in a position of strength and a lot has happened in the first five years for DMC and for this community. And the community has rallied and truly put us on the map for, in, many, in many respects. We'll talk a little bit about the targets. What does it look like setting the targets for phase two um, and with additional considerations such as the COVID impact, which we'll be talking about more next week. And just a glimpse at where we've been as we're preparing for this five-year update, we have been taking a look back, as I said, on data collection, analysis, getting a good glimpse of what's been happening in the last five years. We're drafting our update. We're getting input from you right now. As you can see, we are here taking as much inf information as we can from the community as we build this plan as a community's plan for the future. We go in November um, for the final approval at the board, the DMC board, and it goes to the county or the city board off actually in October. So we're gonna kick off and give you some information. Um, I'm gonna introduce my colleague, Patrick Sieb, who's the DMC EDA's Economic Development Director to start uh, working us through this session today. And we'll have a few other colleagues joining us as well. Patrick? Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate uh, your leadership on this and kicking this off. Uh, for those of you who attended um, Wednesday's presentation, you know we took a deep, did a deep dive in terms of understanding the tax and, uh, and uh, infrastructure impact of investing in a core downtown. And as Lisa said, we have a presentation coming up next week with HRNA to help us understand the economic impact of COVID. Today, as we do this discussion, it's really more focused on what are the elements of the plan and what will it mean to us as a community? And importantly, this is an opportunity, maybe just go to the next slide. Um, as we reflect on successes of the past, really turn our attention to what the future looks like and talk about what are the things that have gone well, but what are the things that we need to pay more attention to? So just quickly in looking back, um, we have um, evaluated ourselves against the original metrics and goals of the DMC development plan. And thus far, there has been 7,000 new jobs created in the first phase and it, more than 80% 80, 80 of those jobs paid more than Rochester's area median income. So there were high quality jobs, not all of them, but uh, in terms of income wise, they were um, a very, um, you know, a very um, high level, high wage earners, but, um, but not all of the positions, not all of the jobs. We've seen new investments of um, more than uh, nearly a billion dollars. 
and uh, tax revenue has continued to grow based on uh, proper new property tax as a result of new construction, payroll taxes, and, and the like. We also use our first phase to do planning to set us up for this next phase around transportation and, um, and uh, public spaces. Ultimately, this work is all about transforming the experience in Rochester, whether you're a visitor, an employee, a resident, a student um, here for a short period of time, really transforming the experience to make Rochester the number one city in America. In our presentation earlier this week, um, we, under, we came to a clear understanding that strong downtowns build strong communities. And this graphic representation is just one metric in terms of why strong downtowns matter. This is an example of the density of tax base in a core downtown, Rochester um, outpunching its weight when compared to other cities of its size. In our case, Rochester's downtown, if you will, the DMC district is defined more broadly than what is typically thought of as a downtown. So it includes the central business district, the core of the downtown, but it includes uh, near adjacent nearby neighborhoods, at least the fringes of those neighborhoods, the entire corridor along 2nd Street to St. Mary's, and now an expansion of the district to include uh, a catchment area at Cascade Lake. So our downtown is, uh, is defined more broadly than might be typically thought of in a downtown. But let's look ahead. Um, and uh, I guess I will just, I'll restate what I, what I mentioned in terms of upcoming events. Um, so this is a, a, a description of those upcoming events. Uh, one I think that's also important for you to know about is coming up on November 17th, um, described as the post-pandemic city, a, a presentation by Tom Fisher former dean of the University of Minnesota College of Design. And you can go to our website to get access to the draft of the update as it now stands. Any comments that you have that, can, that you want to be uh, entered into the official record, do that at the city, uh, city clerk's um, email address and any other questions that you might have for us. Um, I should also say that we are gonna welcome your comments in the Q&A box um, in the, uh, on the Zoom platform. So feel free to offer both comments or questions um, using that uh, Q&A box and, and we will try to respond to as many as we can. So let's talk about the update. Um, this particular session today is really to talk about how the work going forward benefits the community and the region. And I'm going to turn to two of our, my colleagues to assist in this uh, part of the presentation. Uh, I will introduce Catherine Malmberg. Catherine, why don't you wave your hand or, um, uh, there we go. Catherine Malmberg, who has been our consultant in leading our effort to uh, do this update. Catherine is a professor at the University of Minnesota, an architect and a um, developer by background and has served as um, our uh, chief consultant during this process. And you'll also hear from Kevin Bright. Kevin is Director of Sustainability for the City of Rochester and for Destination Medical Center. So you'll be hearing um, both from Catherine and Kevin. And the way we're going to approach this discussion is that we are going to look at four areas. Uh, private investment, mobility, public realm, and jobs, jobs and income private investment, mobility, public realm, and jobs and income. And for each of those sections, we are going to look at what happened, what is the benefits to the community, what is going well, but more importantly, what can be done better, and therefore, what can we expect over the next five years? So we'll go through each of the, the uh, private investment, mobility, public realm, and talk about what happened, the benefit to the community, what's going well, and what can be done better. And I'm gonna ask uh, Catherine to um, uh, kick off the first segment, which is private investment, and, um, and begin walking through this, this framework. So Catherine. And you're on mute. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, and thanks everyone for coming today and uh, talking with us through this. It's exciting to be here. Um, and so first, uh, what happened in the first phase, which when we say phase one, we mean 2015 to the end of 2019. Um, and as Patrick mentioned, there was nearly a billion investment uh, that happened within the DMC district. And as you see in this slide, this is the map of where that happened geographically within the, uh, within the district. And so what does it mean? Um, well, I think it reflects Mayo's commitment to developing Rochester as a destination medical center. Um, and also that the private market has had a response and it's a, it's a great response to the DMC initiative. Um, and the activity that we've seen occur has largely followed the market demand studies um, that were completed as part of the 2015 plan. And that those market demand studies kind of identified which key investment opportunities um, were probably the most enticing to happen first in the downtown. So if we go to the next slide, we can look at these numbers a different way here. So you see in the pie chart, um, that is the $98 million, roughly, of public money um, that was uh, spent in the phase one and how uh, that, that money was kind of cut up into these different categories, a lot of which we're talking about today. And then the bar chart there, you see the targeted goal for phase one private investment of $836 million and that, that phase one actually outperformed um, great positive momentum in the beginning of this plan here. And you see a ratio of about 10 to 1 between the public and the private spending, which is really kind of seen as best practices um, to, to, to see when it's actually at that breakdown. So, um, you know, essentially ahead, a bit ahead of schedule. Um, and the initial focus, looking a little bit into that pie chart there, has been on promoting private development and developing key transit and public realm plans, um, which we're gonna start to see more and more implementation construction in phase two. Um, and to be honest, the, the private market did need some encouragement that that last um, major hotel project to occur in downtown was back in the mid 80s. Um, and that private development um, doing well creates a public benefit through the property taxes and the valuation increases that we see. Um, and that private investment also releases the state funds for infrastructure. So this past year, the DMC received a $20 million check from the state of Minnesota. So that money is now flowing into the city according to the, the sort of way the framework was set up initially. So turning to the next slide. Uh, so what are some of the benefits to the community, right? I mean, you might ask yourself, well, if I'm not going to step a foot inside that building, why, why should I care? Why does it matter to me? Um, and, you know, there are a couple, couple of different things. So it represents that there's private interest in the city and investors are bringing new money from outside to Rochester um, and bringing that to the community. Um, and it so far is cleaning up a lot of what could be considered blighted sites that were downtown, empty parking lots um, being developed into higher density. Um, it improves the tax capacity of, uh, of the downtown. And I, I really recommend if you weren't able to make the um, Urban 3 presentation that is recorded and available online as well. Um, so more payers basically split the levy amongst, um, amongst more bodies, right? Um, and uh, when we have new hotels and visitors coming downtown, that supports um, new restaurants and dining and retail options uh, for, for everybody. Um, and that supports a kind of higher number and density of restaurants and retail than a, a city of this size would typically um, maybe be able to support due to that increased visitation. Um, densifies the um, downtown, also makes it more appealing for more living uh, and housing options. And so about 10% of what has been uh, built in phase one in terms of housing is in the affordable category, which means um, 50 to 60% of affordable to people at 50 to 60% of the area median income. And um, it, that development is also utilizing existing public infrastructure investments that are already downtown. Um, and that infrastructure has been aging, right? Some of the downtown infrastructure is uh, you know, 100 plus years old. 
um, and the you know cycle is up and that needs to be renewed and the new development is a way of um, funding and financing a lot of that downtown infrastructure that was reaching its um, life cycle conclusion. Um, the new construction also has um, the ability to incorporate more uh, sustainability and high performance environmental goals into it in terms of energy efficiency and so on. And um, also thinking about the development that happens as trying to meet different um, community needs at different stages in their lives, right? So, um, you know, as, as people um, move from childhood to adulthood, um, there's different, different types of needs and hopefully by creating a mix of different uses downtown um, at different people's stages in their life, they may have a need um, for, for part of that and then in other stages they might not. But um, that's, that's the plan with these kind of mixed use um, goals that we have for the downtown. So I think moving on to the next one. Um, so talking about kind of what went well in phase one. Um, and so you see some of the, some of the projects that occurred. Um, what, so what's gone well? We've fulfilled hotel needs for the foreseeable future. Um, Discovery Square 1 has leased up and Discovery Square 2 is starting soon. And that was really a key goal of phase one um, because the Discovery Square district is really seen as the economic engine that's going to help diversify the downtown economy um, and really provide that engine of economic growth. Um, we've increased some housing options. We'll talk more about that later. Um, infill has been largely what's been used for development, so primarily empty parking lots turning into development sites. Um, and that helps leverage, again, the existing infrastructure um, and also speaks to a strategy around sustainability, um, preventing green land um, area, green field area, um, from being developed by using the brown fields that are in the center of the city. So Catherine, let me, uh, let me just use that as a segue um, to really invite Kevin um, uh, to come on live here. And just, so, so the story is a lot of new investment, some things are going well, but what have we been learning and what can we be do, doing better as we think about the next phase? And so Kevin, um, would, you, would you comment on that? And, and also I would invite the listeners, that as Kevin is teasing these out, if you will, or talking about these, um, that there may be other ideas that you want to offer up as things that where we can do, be doing better. So think of these as not an all-inclusive list, but a beginning list and ones, and, and, and feel free to augment it. So Kevin? Sure. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here are a quick three bullets of things that we acknowledge and kind of have recognized over the past five years that need further attention looking forward. First is a increased diversity of housing options and price points, especially in our downtown. So by this, we mean ownership opportunities as well as rental opportunities and trying to diversify kind of the different sets of um, opportunities that you see on the bottom of this graphic, uh, the different um, building types, for instance, uh, showing kind of the missing middle that hasn't really been in the downtown um, yet, but we're hoping to further build that out over the next five and 15 years of the project. Second is supporting new models for local retail. So thinking about are there ways that we can utilize vacant lots in our downtown to support local entrepreneurs, local businesses and startups that are thinking about forming in our, um, and we'd like them to be downtown because we're trying to create an ecosystem that can support businesses from their starts um, to kind of when they're, uh, full-bodied and kind of support themselves. And third, further advocate for the prevailing wage on uh, support of local and targeted businesses in our construction industry. Um, we'll talk more about this in section four as it relates to the jobs and income portion. Um, there's some pretty exciting and, and interesting results thus far, but no, there's further work ahead on that topic as well. Next slide, please. So this also sets up well kind of what we're thinking about over the next five years. Um, specifically, as Catherine mentioned, Discovery Square was viewed as the economic engine for the support of the, dis the Destination Medical Center project. So as it starts construction, it's another kind of brick and mortar example of this budding bio med tech entrepreneur sector that's growing in our downtown. That's really building economic resiliency. And I'll use that term a few times during the presentation today and that the more options for employment that exist within our city, as well as the more options for mobility or the more housing options, the more resilient our community becomes. 
So from an economic standpoint, Discovery Square 2 is pretty exciting in that that does represent some economic resiliency being built as part of the project. Second um, has to do with affordable housing. So the DMC board has uh, said that this is a strategic priority for the project looking forward and further attention will be um, set on it in order to make sure that further development of affordable housing is, uh, occurs in the downtown as well as throughout our community in conjunction with community partners. And finally, a third graphic kind of shows uh, different types of retail options. So um, these concrete barriers were painted in support of local artists in order to support outdoor eating uh, in our downtown during COVID-19. Um, we'll talk more about the next steps for the COVID-19 presentation next week. Um, but are there other ways that we can help support local businesses in our downtown as well as the development of new ones? Thank you, Kevin. And again, uh, I really encourage um, those of you who are watching and listening, if you have additional comments of things that we can be do, doing better. So if you go back up one slide, Aaron, just to um, uh, sort of help remind the audience, the, the sort of sequence of this is, uh, kind of a recap of things that we've done and what's gone well, but really what, what can we do better and therefore what does that mean for the next five years? So we've talked about private investment. These are things that we imagine that we can be doing better. And next slide, we, and we talked about some and give some illustrations of specific examples. So now let's move to mobility. This is a, another big area of commitment on behalf of Destination Medical Center and, and city leadership. So let's follow the same model, turn to Catherine to talk about uh, what has happened and what's the benefit to the community, what's going well, and, and uh, Kevin gets to deliver um, the, the conversation about where we can do better. So Catherine. Great, thank you. Okay, so here in mobility, in short, it was a lot of planning exercises and a lot of prototyping to um, these projects are very kind of long-term big projects. So we wanna make sure that we're um, you know, fine tuning them and getting them uh, planned appropriately and are gonna be um, really great additions. And why, why are we doing it? Well, I think a big focus is to build um, mobility resiliency to use, use Kevin's term. So each piece of the puzzle, when we think about mobility holistically, um, and there's so many different ways to think about mobility, everything from, um, you know, how do I know that when I drive my car downtown, there'll be a place where I can park so I can get to my appointment, to, um, you know, riding the scooter, and there's, you know, everything in between. And so each piece of this decreases the congestion of um, our roads, which given the growth projections of, of employment and, and people living downtown, that um, congestion is something we're very um, focused on, making sure when this is over that we have um, roads that work for everyone. And it also offers people options and choice at different price points um, for how they might wanna get around. Um, and so I know over the first phase, there's been a lot of discussion about different um, bike lanes and scooters and other kind of micro mobility options. Um, and we're, we're really focused on some of these as um, basically ways to um, improve choice and decrease congestion. Um, so some of the big planning initiatives that might um, be somewhat familiar to you, because I think there've been other community meetings around them, is the, the ITS plans, the integrated transit studies that were completed that tried to look holistically um, at all of the different parts and pieces over time how that can all uh, work together, right? So transit and parking and tra transit demand management, how the streets are used, um, the idea of the city loop. Um, and all of this is, um, you know, something that is linked to our travel commuting, commuting targets that are laid out in the initial plan and how we need to mode shift um, people away from just single occupant vehicles because at the end of this plan, it's still projected to have just as many single occupant vehicles driving downtown, but so many more people that need to get downtown. Um, and so the, in the actual plan document that you can review online, there's more detailed tables like what you're seeing here and links to get to like these very detailed plans around each of these projects. Maybe we can go to the next slide. So again, what are, what are benefits to the community? It's that um, choice, micro-mobility options, car share options, um, the electric buses um, that are gonna improve air quality. Um, there's additional parking facilities, ramp six was completed during um, phase one. Um, and 
trying to improve travel uh, safety for everyone, no matter what mode that they, they use. Um, there's some environmental impact reductions that we're hoping for as well through the use of e-bikes and scooters. And, um, you know, really safety is central um, and really making sure that our infrastructure provides uh, safety no matter what mode you're using. The next slide here. Um, so what's going well, I think we're getting some more funding diversification, right? We're aiming for federal support on some of these things like the circulator, um, electric buses, the TOD planning grant. Um, and hope, hopeful that by introducing these prototypes of micromobility, more people will be interested in trying and using them. Um, and it's also recognition of transit as a community priority um, and really making that, um, making the downtown more accessible and more linked to resources um, throughout. So the rapid transit circulator planning has been a huge initiative recently. Hopefully we've been able to um, participate in that planning um, and further prototyping is going to be um, developed as that, as that process continues. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, I think this is a good moment for me to acknowledge the leadership from our city colleagues in advancing the rapid transit initiative um, recently approved by city council and DMC. And I think a very, very competitive application submitted to the um, FTA, and we'll learn more about uh, the results of that in the in the spring and summer. Uh, and with that in mind, Kevin, um, again, it's sort of this pattern we have for our conversation today. Tell talk about what we think we can be doing better, what, where we think we can be doing better with respect to this work. Sure. Uh, so through a number of community conversations that we've kind of been undertaking over the past month or month and a half here, there's some kind of key themes that have been coming out of those. Um, one is that transit's still difficult for users. We're hopeful as the rapid transit circulator becomes further developed, that'll help ease some of the burden uh, for transit dependent riders in our community. Um, but it is one piece of a larger puzzle, which is Rochester public transit within the community itself. So it's kind of trying to make sure that these are both developed and addressing the same needs and, and uh, in a streamlined kind of manner moving forward. Um, there is an opportunity kind of along that same line for opportunity for better community-wide service. So as we're connecting downtown to other areas of the city, that's something to be mindful of, especially over the next five years as the circulator becomes further developed in the downtown core of the city. And second, and finally is the prioritization of phase two of the circulator. So phase one is focusing on the West Transit Village through the downtown and around the government center. Phase two is the portion running south towards Grant Park or area of south of the city, Seneca, for perhaps. Um, the development of that circulator will really help address the needs of the users that are in the Slatterly Park, Meadow Park neighborhoods. So prioritizing its development in phase two um, and making sure that that happens quickly or as quickly as we can will help serve those neighborhoods well and the transit dependent riders that live in that area of the city itself. Kevin, um, before, you, before you go any further, um, there is a, a, a note in the chat box um, that I'll just share with the audience that asks about, are there plans to improve directional signage to parking areas? Uh, this, uh, this person says, I read, I read in urban planning articles that uh, downtown traffic congestion is oftentimes simply caused by drivers looking for parking areas. And I think, I think that might, uh, that more globally, that, um, that may sort of fit into uh, what we can do better by talking about how do we make um, uh, uh, the systems easier for people to um, understand whether it's parking, um, how to use ride sharing, how to use um, uh, our car. So there may be something, and I know we have an app that's been developed and a program called um, the Transportation Arrive Rochester. Um, so I think we may want to add that to what we can be doing better, which is to um, make it easier, more consumable for people to use the current system. Yeah, I think that's well put. And just an increased awareness of what's available and what we're working on too, I think would benefit the, the community broadly. So for instance, the Our Car program um, still isn't well understood or utilized yet. Um, but the more that it is, I think the more that people will find it useful to their daily lives and help them run the errands that they're trying to accomplish on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that's well put. Um, I, as it relates to the real-time parking 
I know that is part of the discussion for the development of the mobility hub or the transit village on the west side. Um, and there is some thought or, or thinking about could it be expanded to other parking garages in the downtown as well. So it's being considered and, and discussed, um, but no real timeline associated with that beyond the development of the West Transit Village. Uh, next slide, please. So what do the next five years entail here? Um, really the primary focus is um, acting on the extensive planning that's occurred within the first five years of the project over the next five, and primarily the development of the rapid transit circulator in the downtown of the city. Um, it's requiring a, a lot of work, but rightfully so, because we wanna get it right. Um, so as that project rolls out, it will be fully, uh, the kind of anticipated schedule is um, starting to build out towards the end of phase two. So a, a number of years uh, as it gets fully developed in our downtown. And at the same time, starting to build up these micro mobility programs at the same time, um, demonstrate their usership and ridership. And perhaps with that demonstrated ridership, other opportunities to expand its service more broadly throughout the community to serve other areas too. But really what's that that is dependent on is kind of proving that these programs are successful within the city too. So there's um, an aspect of making sure that we're demonstrating and recruiting ridership for the program so that they continue to be utilized and successful here in the city. Um, one other challenge I might throw in there is seasonality. So we live in Minnesota, there, it snows quite a bit and snow builds up on roads. So Catherine mentioned safety of all riders. And that becomes even more of an issue during the winter time when snow infringes on the road sides, decreasing the amount of uh, travel lane width for cars, buses, but also bikes and pedestrians that may need to use it. So uh, protecting all users of these roads is critically important, especially in the wintertime. I mean, we hear often that nobody rides bikes in the wintertime. Well, there's other reasons besides it's cold. Like we all know how to dress for the wintertime and wear winter coats and gloves, but part of it is the safety factor. And if there aren't protected bike lanes or way protecting all users, um, that may be the kind of the straw that breaks the willingness of a biker to ride during the winter time because there's just not enough space for them to feel safe to do so when they're right next to a car versus used to having maybe the full three foot length of the side of a roadway, for instance. Great. Anything to add there, Patrick? Thank you. No, I, I think this is good. I think, um, again, as a, as a reminder in this conversation, this discussion, we are really talking about the kinds of public investments, public infrastructure investments that DMC is enabled to do with the support of the state legislature um, and the state of Minnesota so that we can achieve the outcomes that we're talking about with respect to jobs and economic growth and tax base and, and, and experience. So one of the next area we're gonna talk about really directly relates to experience, which is public realm. And again, we'll use the same format we've been using and Catherine, I'll ask you to talk about uh, what's happened and the benefits and where we're, you know, what's been going well and, and, uh, and then we'll talk about where we're gonna, where we can improve. Catherine? Great, thanks. So again, um, you, can f you can find this table um, in the overall update document with links to these projects that we're gonna talk about here. Um, but really central to the initial DMC master plan was this idea that they create a, a central signature public space in each of the sub-districts. Right, so that map that Patrick showed up at the um, top of the presentation with the various subdistricts, each of those is supposed to have a signature public space within it. Um, so planning um, occurred in the first five years with the focus first on Heart of the City and Discovery Walk as really being the most intensively utilized and sort of um, central districts. So um, we started there. And then um, there was also planning that was completed for the St. Mary's um, area as well, subdistrict as well. And uh, in heart of the city, as I'm sure you're all aware, construction is already well underway. Um, and that is going to continue here in phase two, obviously. And then Discovery Walk um, is also now approved to move further into design development. Um, so, and. I think that the other um, planning exercises for the other sub-districts will be a focus of um, planning attention during phase two. Um, so if we could move to the next. 
Next slide. There we go. Um, so what are some of the benefits to the community? Well, these public spaces really align with that health vision for the DMC initiative, right? Connecting people more to nature and creating reasons that they wanna be out and walking around downtown. Um, the more pleasant that experience is, the more people will wanna move around. Um, and we're really focused on the inclusivity of public space for all residents. Um, and uh, there are also environmental and sustainability uh, benefits that come as well. Some of these projects have um, great kind of what we call green infrastructure elements as well that help uh, mitigate uh, stormwater flow and things like that. Um, and connections between the park infrastructure and the downtown and the vibrancy of downtown is really important. So if we can go to the next slide. Some of the things that are going well um, is uh, we're incorporating um, local artists um, in the heart of the city and that will be continued, that focus will be in, in continued and built upon in Discovery, in the Discovery Walk project, which is the linear park project in Discovery Square. Um, and this uh, community engagement piece that Kevin has, uh, can probably speak in more detail to um, with this co-design process, I think is also a really exciting thing. Um, you know, I uh, have the opportunity to work on, on projects in other parts of the country as well, and I just think this co-design process that you guys are doing here is, is so exciting. Um, and the downtown economic impact of these public realm investments, I mean, these public realm investments drive private investment that want to be near um, this public realm. So it's a great way to improve and continue to build on that attractiveness of the downtown um, and attract private investment. Um, and then there's also been the opportunity to do some, um, the business forward pilot for the heart of the city uh, public realm project, um, I think was another opportunity for DMC to help support um, local businesses during that construction phase. So, Kevin, what have we been learning? What have we been learning? We've been learning a lot. Um, so, what can we be doing better? Particularly, there are opportunities for us along the lines of this community engagement and expanding on equitable engagement and prioritizing perhaps the voices of underserved and marginalized communities here in Rochester to help inform and make better public spaces for the city of Rochester. Uh, we piloted a, a phase of this called the community co-design process for the Discovery Walk project and its design. Um, and it was very insightful and we learned a lot that's both applicable for the Discovery Walk project, but also applicable for other park projects at the DMC, but um, has applications broadly for the city and county as well. So we're starting to share uh, what we learned from this process, the takeaways and themes of what we heard from the co-designers themselves and seeing our, uh, how this might be applicable to other planning activities that we're undertaking. And we're pretty excited about next steps for that. Um, second is just startly starting to implement planning activities. So we spent a lot of the first five years planning these public spaces, the heart of the city, Discovery Walk, as Catherine mentioned, um, and implementing these projects uh, causes disruption. So making sure that we're being mindful about so the staging and sequencing of projects, particularly in the downtown, is something that we'll, we'll be paying closer attention to as a way to minimize disruption, both for businesses, visitors, and residents in our community. And third is opportunities to further um, mitigate business impacts associated with construction. So um, we've had some great leadership from Jamie Rothy and Josh Johnson at the city on uh, this business forward strategy for Heart of the City. Um, and looking forward and looking for ways that we can continue this uh, business forward strategy on future public realm projects that are occurring in our downtown. Uh, the next one being this Discovery Walk project that Catherine mentioned. Um, I'm starting to see ways and integrate new ideas that we're learning from other cities and bringing them to Rochester as well. Anything to add there, Patrick? No, I would actually, Aaron, go back to the previous slide. Uh, yeah, the, the, I think it's worth um, just giving face to the um, co-designers that you mentioned and uh, Catherine briefly referred to it, but uh, these individuals became part of the design team, are part of the design team for Discovery Walk. And they bring unique life experiences and perspectives and points of view that wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't otherwise benefit from, um, but for the role they're playing as part of the, of the design team. And we're learning from this model in terms of how does it work and how do we, how do we uh, properly compensate people to participate at the level that they are participating. And I know that 
this um, this methodology is being also tested out with the rapid transit design and and some other um, other efforts in the city. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, and I think really it boils down to prioritizing lived experience over learned experience in the design process and that the best intention designer can't channel the perspective and insight that folks that maybe struggle with um, physical ability challenges on a daily basis um, live on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, prioritizing those voices, integrating them in the design team is critically important because the design's better for it and it's a more inclusive design. Um, can we skip ahead a couple slides, Aaron? And then the last part of this is talking about what to expect over the next five years. So really it's the two primary projects that are shown here are the major construction activity that's set to occur. One is the completion of the heart of the city phase one, which is kind of the Eastern portion of the public realm project in our downtown. And the second is the starting the construction of the discovery walk project, which will connect this Peace Plaza area in front of Gonda to Soldiers Field Park. So we're starting to build out kind of these connected park infrastructure pathways in our downtown, starting at Soldiers Field Park, working our way north to this heart of the city plaza area. Um, so expect that construction activity to, to continue and that uh, budget seems to be in uh, stages of approval as we speak. And then there is some additional planning for other public realm spaces. Um, Catherine mentioned some activity of, around the schematic design development for St. Mary's public realm, kind of on the western edge of the DMC district towards St. Mary's Hospital. And then finalizing some park elements of the rapid transit circulator as well. So part of the design focus for that project is making sure that folks that are visiting our community or visiting the downtown residents, for instance, can see where the circulator runs based on how it's uh, it's landscape architecture and the landscape elements that are integrated into it. So are there visual cues that we can integrate so people understand that's where the circulator is and that understand where it's headed? Um, if, go ahead. Yeah, and Kevin, I might just uh, use this particular image uh, looking at the Galleria shops at Univers University Square building um, in the background of the Peace Plaza construction, which um, this slide, this image is already way out of date in the sense that every, every week um, a considerable amount of progress is being made on that project. Um, so much so that it's inspiring a conversation about whether or not we can pursue the longer term vision of connecting Mayo, C Mayo Civic Center um, through the Galleria Peace Plaza to, to Gonda and then connecting um, to, Discovery, to Discovery Walk, which will bring you down to Soldiers Field and to the river and really creating this, this sort of river to river loop um, um, uh, that connects um, all, many parts of our downtown. And so I'll just foreshadow uh, for the audience that we are in active conversation about uh, ways in which we could uh, make progress on that vision of, of, uh, of uh, creating a connection through the Galleria, um, connecting both the Mayo Civic Center and Gonda via, via Peace Plaza. So with that, uh, let's move to our last segment where we're going to talk about jobs and income, diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. And again, using the same format we've been using, Catherine, I'll turn it to you. Great, great. Yeah, and I'll try and move through this relatively quickly because I know we want some time for Q&A at the end here as well. Um, so here are the jobs figures. Um, you can see the um, over 7,700 jobs roughly were created. Um, the vast majority of those male clinic jobs. Um, and that uh, also helps skew towards well-paying jobs. So almost 85% of the jobs pay more than 85% of AMI, which is the area median income. Um, so the service sector pay um, is concerning. Um, I, I think that we feel living wages of $15 an hour or greater um, may be needed to support those uh, downtown workers and reduce the future needs for additional affordable housing. Um, but that is a smaller portion of the overall jobs. Um, and um, there have been also during phase one expanded resources and expertise within the city, which has been great on um, project management for targeted business utilization. And that has a community wide um, impact as well. So then moving to the next. Um, 
So um, looking for diversification of the economic sectors, growing that biomed tech sector, um, an additional um, focus on including disadvantages, disadvantaged businesses, um, construction workers um, have opportunities that are now closer to home um, to, to do a lot of great work um, with all the construction going on. Um, this target um, goal is somewhat easier to measure than some of the others that we're trying to, to track. Um, so um, we're looking to increase the ways in which we measure recruitment of new businesses, homegrown um, economic development that's also growing talent. Um, and there's so many different collaborations across sectors and industry that are really um, exciting. And um, we hope to continue identifying opportunities for um, building existing um, entrepreneur community here. Um, and really the, the goal is that no good idea or person is left on the sidelines. Um, and that this, this is a sign of um, the economy being able to um, reach its, its full potential. So that's um, certainly part of this approach in the, in the benefits to the community on the, on the jobs side of things. Next slide. So the whole economic model for DMC is really built off of new jobs, right? And that's the driver of the other successes in terms of investment and tax income and all of those sorts of things, right? So it starts from those jobs and the quality of those jobs is also important. Um, so the construction wage impact has also been um, significant. You can see there the average um, wages for DMC construction projects are above um, even average construction wages for the region. Um, but there are, of course, additional opportunities, and maybe I'll turn this over to Kevin at this point um, for for job growth as well. Sure. Next slide, please. Yeah. So as Catherine mentioned, there are some opportunities for uh, attention moving forward. One is the the rates that we're seeing for the hospitality and service sector. Um, on average, we're about thirty percent area median income over the first five years. Um, so having I was thinking about that over the next five and, and future of the project. Um, and very intimately closely tied to that is building out the housing and affordability options in our downtown as well. So providing places for people to work and live in our downtown is going to be critically important and not just rent, but also ownership opportunities there. Another opportunity is additional job sector development. So are there ways that we can um, further build out the economy, both in our downtown, but throughout our community? focused on this concept of economic resiliency. So the more opportunities and job opportunities that exist that support this budding entrepreneurship ecosystem, the more jobs there are or opportunities for trailing talents for folks that are moving to Rochester for Mayo Clinic jobs, for instance, or healthcare industry jobs. And closely tied to that then is building pathways within um, companies and even within our community to higher paying jobs. Part of that is opportunity, but also education. Um, is closely tied with that. So uh, aligning ourselves with their higher education partners is going to be um, something, an area of focus too, along those, along those lines. And finally, we mentioned this a little bit in the, earlier in the private development section, but vacant space activation. So are there ways that we can use underutilized space in our downtown to help support business opportunities um, for budding business entrepreneurs? And perhaps they could be a pathway to brick and mortar opportunities in our downtown, ideally. Um, but we see this as a way to further support our local entrepreneurs here in Rochester um, by building out some of these kind of critical key infrastructure needs that we may have uh, so that we can um, fully kind of utilize the area that we have available to us in the downtown district um, moving forward. So next slide, please. So additional community benefits are, are listed here too. So this, what this slide is meant to represent are some of the other uh, areas of work that have been ongoing within the DMC um, EDA, um, as well as our city partners that are uh, also trying to address some other community needs. So part of my job and, and the job of the sustainability team, Lauren Jensen at the city, Cindy Steinhauser, as well as Patrick, uh, is building out our environmental and sustainability programming and, and kind of knowledge base within our community. So that will continue over the next five years and throughout the, the rest of the project. Um, the second bullet here on entrepreneurism is building out an entrepreneur ecosystem. So Chris Shad at the DMC projects leading this work, um, closely tied to the work in Discovery Square. 
Third is focusing attention on building minority and women-owned business capacity locally. So part of that's a strategy for this vacant area lot um, concept that was mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, another area of focus is uh, improving downtown experience. So one of kind of the key pieces of research leading into the DMC project was understanding that folks um, weren't necessarily satisfied with the services and opportunities and offerings in our downtown. And this was what came from both visitors and residents alike. So keeping uh, at, or focusing our attention on is, is this downtown experience improving over time and are there key uh, infrastructure needs that we can help address in order to help improve their experience. Um, and some work has been going into that in, in the development of a Rochester app, but also in the mixed use development itself and the services that they're bringing to the, town, the downtown as well. And then finally, um, building out kind of a data infrastructure to help inform decision making across agencies. So this, some of this is tied to some environmental work where we're building out some air quality monitoring systems. Um, there are also some transit and mobility counters that are starting to be installed too to help us better understand how roadways in our downtown are being used and by what users uh, in order to help prioritize decision-making moving forward. Anything to add, Patrick? No, I think this is, I think this is a, a good way of actually reminding ourselves and reminding the audience that we understand that um, all of our work is done in collaboration and partnership with, with many, many others. So nothing gets done uh, by one organization, by the, by the city or by uh, any single business. It's really the collaborative effort that occurs across sectors, um, nonprofits, um, advocacy groups. Um, but this whole idea of uh, data infrastructure, I think, is critically important. Like, how do we, how do we all understand and, and share the same facts so that we can make informed decision making? I'm um, just moving to the next slide, and, and we're going to be wrapping up here in a, in a couple of minutes. And I would like to, um, I'm going to put, um, uh, I'm going to put Mayor Norton on the spot if, if she's still on, on, online. She has been participating in these sessions, and I am going to ask if she would be willing to make some comments. I'm going to give you the floor in just a moment, Mayor. Um, before doing that, just uh, just another topic to, to reflect on is the investment in streets and sewers. Yeah, in Wednesday's presentation by Urban3, um, uh, Joe Menicosi uh, uh, reminded us um, that every city carries responsibilities that go on in perpetuity, the streets and sewers and that they eventually need to be replaced. And that while they may be um, built for a 50 year standard, 50 years will come and then you have to rebuild and then you have to rebuild again in 50 years. And a lot of the downtown infrastructure, the streets and sewers um, were built at a time that uh, didn't accommodate uh, today's demands and tomorrow's, and tomorrow's demands. And so a lot of the work that we're seeing happening, very disruptive as it is and very expensive, um, um, is necessary in order for Rochester to grow in the future. And they have to be replaced anyway. They're ending, they're coming to the end of their life expectancy. And, and so modeling out and understanding um, the, the re replacement of those key pieces of infrastructure is critical and was part of the case that led to the state of Minnesota committing to support this initiative. Um, next slide is uh, really reflects or recognizes that ultimately this is about building the kind of community experience that we can be proud of. The, the kind of experience where if you're an empty nester and you want to uh, convince your um, son or daughter to move their family back to Rochester, that there's a reason to come back. There's, a, there's jobs to come back to. There's interests and activities to come back to. If you're a, a new visitor to Rochester because perhaps you're here for a Mayo Clinic appointment that you say, wow, I wanna come back to Rochester, not because I need to come back for a clinic appointment, but because it's an interesting place. Or if you are a, a medical resident here on a fellowship, recognizing that Mayo is the, your top choice of any place to be, but when you get here, you find that the city is very livable and attractive and, and something that would offer you a long-term future. So it's really about how do we build the kind of community experience that attracts and welcomes and, and uh, keeps all people uh, understand seeing Rochester as a number one option. Uh, the next slide 
uh, is really uh, just to, to tell you that one of the tools that DMC brings to this, not only our planning work, our data analysis work, uh, the staff capacity, but is also the public investment resources that have been made available via the DMC legislation. And in the first phase of this project, um, uh, uh, Catherine mentioned that there was about $98 million, so nearly $100 million that was invested of public resources, um, state and local resources into um, projects and initiatives. And we are projecting that because of the formula that, um, that allows for state support, that there will be nearly $200 million available over the next five years, 2020 through 2024. And we are beginning to project or forecast the distribution of those, of those resources. But this is really one of the major tools that Rochester has that no other community has, which is this uh, anticipated, projected, forecasted um, city and, and really committed state investment now at nearly 20 to $25 million a year to support um, these initiatives. Um, so with that, uh, Mayor, I don't know if we've got you live, and if, if so, I'd love to um, ask if you would make any comments or um, observations. You've been so involved in all of this work predating this and, and through all of this work over the past several months. Mayor? Sure, Patrick, thank you. And I, this is a wonderful presentation, and it's really um, exciting to see that what we talked about six years ago is becoming a reality that our community is growing and changing at a time when many communities um, would be, and I know they are jealous of what we have here and what's happening, that uh, what we talked about is, is becoming a reality. So um, I, I really also wanted to thank you for the focus today because I think the focus has to be not just on what we've done and what we planned, but how can we do it better? And so what you've done today, the talk that you've, you've had um, is a first phase of that. I think the second phase is really the expectation that people in this community will give you feedback beyond what you've already heard. And, and um, I think you've opened the door for that here uh, with your presentation today. Uh, you know, we, as most people probably know, we're just rated number five in livability uh, as a place to live. Um, we've been one in the past. My goal would be to be one again. And I say five is pretty good given the amount of construction that's going on in this community, uh, which leads me to the one thing I really want to talk about, which is how important what you're doing here and that two-way communication, not just one way, but two-way communication with a broader sector of the public is just going to be vital in not only doing the right thing for our community, but having the ownership of every member of this community to the work that's being done so that they understand it, they feel like they're part of it. And I think that's really going to be important as we bring new businesses here. Um, I, I really found it interesting your, your talk about uh, is wage the issue or is building more affordable housing the issue and how do you balance that? I think that's a really wonderful discussion to be having uh, as we move ahead and also to be mindful of the impact that all this construction and the tax implications of our work here um, are having on our current uh, businesses. And so again, that moves back to that importance of communication uh, and, and two-way communication as we move forward. But thank you so much for all you're doing. It's exciting and I'm really looking forward to see uh, Heart of the City, which I think will be the next uh, concluding uh, development. That's right. So That's right. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate your leadership now and, and uh, in the future. So with that, I guess I would like to um, bring to closure, if Aaron, just to put on the screen for one more moment, the upcoming um, activities. So as a reminder, uh, we had a presentation on Wednesday by Urban3. It's on our website. If you didn't get a chance to look at it, 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 it is worth looking at. It's a little bit nerdy, a little bit, uh, you know, wonky, but uh, really good information about how density helps grow a city's tax base and help relieve the pressure on residential property owners. Um, today's presentation, we'll uh, archive it, so feel free to share it um, with others that you think might be interested. Next, fr next Friday, HRNA is doing a presentation about the economic impact of COVID and how to begin projecting di directly what it will mean to Rochester and what recovery will look like. Tom Fisher on November 17th, the post-pandemic city, really how are cities going to innovate during this time and what are gonna be the strongest cities coming out of this? What will be those characteristics? Um, so those are a series of upcoming uh, pan uh, uh, webinars. We'll be in front of um, city council on October 19th and there's a public hearing at DMC 
on uh, November 19th. So uh, lots of opportunity. And again, uh, on our website, you'll see ways to weigh in with any additional questions or comments that you would like us to consider as we uh, wrap up this work. So thank you, Catherine and Kevin. Uh, nice job. Um, thank you to all of you who uh, joined and stayed with us through this, this presentation. Lisa and DMC team, Jamie, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, everyone.